So let's delve a little bit deeper into the scanf function that we mentioned a little bit ago. If you recall, scanf is a function that allows us to read user input into our program, usually done through the terminal. And like printf, this function can be found in the stdio.h file. That's part of the C standard library. So if we want to use scanf, we must make sure that we are including stdio.h. And now let's kind of look at the syntax for scanf. As you can see, we take a couple of uh, inputs, the first one being a format string, and then we take a couple of addresses. We don't really have to know what addresses are right now. Uh, they'll be discussed later in another video. Uh, but just think about addresses as the locations where we're going to be putting the values that we're reading in from the user. Let's take a closer look at this format string. The format string just tells Scanf how we want to read in the values that are entered by the user. And here's an example format string that we could use in Scanf, which is percent %d percent %f. If you remember our conversion specifiers, percent %d stands for an integer and percent %f stands for a floating point number. So if we were to use this format string in Scanf, what would happen is we would first try to read in an integer and then we would try to read in a floating point number. Now let's look at these addresses. Uh, the addresses, like I said, are just the locations where we're going to store the values written by the user. We usually want to store values within variables, and the way that we provide an address to a variable is by typing an ampersand followed by the name of the variable that we want to store the value in. And also, we have to provide an address for every conversion specifier in the format string, and the order in which we put in these addresses does matter. So if you look at the previous example with percent %b and percent %f, if we first try reading percent %d, we would read the integer, and then we would try to store its value in address 1, and then we would read in the floating point number, and we would try to store its value in address 2. So as you can see, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the uh, conversion specifiers in the format string and the addresses that we enter into scanf. If this still doesn't make a lot of sense, we have a simple example here where I'm defining two variables that I want to populate with values read in from the user, and we're prompting the user to enter values for these variables, which are the age and wage in dollars per hour, and then we call scanf with a format string %d %f so that we first read in an integer and store its value in age, and then we read in a floating point number from the user and try to store its value in wage. Then we just repeat the values back to the user. So let's try running this program and see how it works. As you can see, I have my Visual Studio Code editor open with the same program that we saw in the slides. So let's try running it. As you can see, it compiles with no warnings. So right now, let's just do dot slash scanf1. And as we can see, we're prompted for the age and the wage values in dollars per hour. So let's enter something in 22 and 34.5 as an example. And when we're entering these values, we can separate them by any form of white space. This could be just hitting space on the keyboard or hitting enter after every value. It doesn't really matter how you enter them, it's just as long as there's some white space in between values. And as you can see, we get uh, the values that we've entered repeated back to us. But if you're particularly observ observant, you might see that there are some flaws with how we're doing things right now. And this is that we are putting a lot of trust on the end user. We can't really guarantee that the user is going to try putting in a integer and then a floating point number. We can always assume that the user could put in a value that doesn't make sense. So let's try entering something in like blue and hello. If we hit enter, we can see that the values that are repeated back to us don't make a lot of sense. And this is because we're trying to interpret blue, the string, as an integer, and then we're trying to interpret hello as a floating point number, which as we might imagine, does not provide us with useful results. But how can we check that the types of data entered in by the user are the types that we're expecting to read in into our program? For this, we'll need the return value for scanf. After we call scanf and read in user input, we will get an integer returned back to us by scanf telling us how many values were read in properly. 
So if there was a type mismatch when reading the values, we would see it reflected in the return value for scanf. So let's try making the program a little bit safer by adding some error checking. As you can see, I have this sample scanf2.c program, and it looks practically the same as the one I showed before, except there are some conditional statements. We haven't really seen this uh, notation, this f else notation, but essentially what's going on is there's a condition within these round brackets, and if the condition is true, we will run line 9, and if the condition is false, we will run line 11. The condition that we're checking is if scanf, the return value for scanf, is equal to 2. We choose 2 because there are two conversion specifiers in the format string, so that means we're trying to read two values. So we're checking if the number of values that were correctly read in is 2. So, if we try running this program and see what values it prints out when we enter uh, kind of unconventional inputs, we can see that it prints out type mismatch aborting. So it is not printing out the values back to us because the values that we would get are, would not be particularly useful. But if we were to run this with values that do make sense, like 22 and 34.5, then the program works as expected. So as you can see, the return value for scanf has helped us make this program just a little bit safer. So the moral of the story here is, always check the return value for scanf. More specifically, check that the return value for scanf is equal to the number of conversion specifiers in your format string. This is all we really have to know about scanf for now. So now we'll be moving into internal forms. Now I'm going to show you some more special characters that we can print out. So let's look at the screen and we're going to go line by line. The first print statement is about new line characters. So I'm sure you've seen this before. So as you can see in the output, it says hello world with a new line character, with a tab. And it says, how are you today? The second print statement is about double quotation marks. So to print out a double quotation mark, what you need to do is you need to type backslash. Immediately, you need to write the double quotation mark right in front of it. So if you see the result, it says, I command the door, open sesame. The third print statement is a combination of double quotation and backslash. So to print out the backslash, what you need to do is you need to uh, type another backslash right in front of another backslash. So if you look at the output, it says backslash is done by typing double quotation space backslash space double quotation. Now the last print statement is called no is about null characters. So what a null character does is that it tells the computer to escape from the string. And the null character is backslash zero. So if you look at the output, instead of printing golden bear panda, it only printed golden bear. So as soon as it read the null character, the computer just immediately escaped and it only printed out golden bear. This time, I want to show you guys some more features that involves with printf and it is about conversion specifier. On this screen, I've already included some conversion specifiers. The very first variable type I want to show you is character type. So in order to print out a character type, the conversion is percentage %c. If we look at the output, it printed out 1. Now, one warning with the character type is that you have to use single quotes. If you use double quotes, then C will understand this as a string. So please use single quotes. Now, next one is Boolean. In order to use Boolean, we have to call a library called standard bool.h. So I already included that in the very top of the code. So for me, we could set the Boolean equal to true, false, or one, or zero. Now, in order to print out Boolean, well, we cannot print out the word right now because that's for later. Right now, we're just going to print out the number. So in order to print out the number, we use percentage %d. And if we look at the output, it printed out 1 
because true is equal to 1 in binary. The next type is integer. Integer contains 4 bytes and the number ranges from minus 2 trillion all the way, all the way up to 2 trillion. So in order to print out integer, the conversion is percentage %d. If we look at the output, it printed out 214, and that makes sense. Now, next one is a short type. Now, short type is kind of like integer, except it takes less memory. So short is 2 bytes, and the number range is from, nine, is from minus 32,000 all the way to positive 32,000. And in order to print short data type, the specifier is percentage %hd. Now, next data type that we're going to talk about is unsigned integer. The, the conversion specifier for unsigned integer is percentage %u. So, I set unsigned integer into 420. And if you look at the output, it gives us 420. And unsigned integer is kind of different from integer. So it is also 4 bytes. However, unsigned integer only contains positive numbers. So it ranges from 0 all the way to 4 trillion. Now, the next two data types are kind of weird. So whenever we want to include decimals, we could either choose float or double. Sometimes double can be read as long float. Now, float is 4 bytes, and it ranges from minus 3.4 times 10th to the 38th power all the way to 3.4 times 10 to the 38th power, and it is accurate up to 6 decimal places. Double or long float, on the other hand, it is 8 bytes, and it ranges from minus 1.7 times 10 to the 308th power, all the way to 1.7 times 10 to the 308th power, and it is accurate up to 15 decimal places. Now, in order to print out float, you use a conversion percentage %f. For double, you use percentage %lf. Now, I set float and double number equal to 150.454. But if we look at the output, it gave us something different. Double gave us the right answer, but float didn't give us the right answer. Actually, it is kind of off. So whenever we are involving with decimals, we might lose precision if we're using float data type. However, that doesn't mean that double type is always good. If we look at the sizes, well, double takes in more space compared to float type. So, for you software engineers, you have to make the decision on what data type that you have to use. If you use float, well, you should use float only if you are only looking into one or two or three decimal places. But if you need to be more accurate, then I highly suggest you to use double. But it takes some more memory, so you'll be sacrificing some storage. This time, we are going to convert decimal into a 32-bit binary. So on my tablet, um, we are going to convert 45.45 into 32-bit binary. So first, we need to convert the units into binary. So our units are 45. So 45 into binary is 101. 101. Okay. And this is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32. Okay. And then next, we're going to convert the decimal into binary. So this step is it's a bit longer, but it's manageable. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to 
write our decimal. So our decimal is 0 0.45. And then we're going to multiply this by 2. We get 0 0.9. Okay. Then we need to record the unit of the result. So the unit is 0. So we're going to record it right here. Okay. After that, we're going to multiply the decimal by 2. And then after that, we're going to find the unit, record it, multiply by 2. So this step is going to be repeated. Okay. So let's do it. 0 0.9 times 2 equals 1.8 minus 1. And then 0 0.8 times 2 equals 1.6. Unit is 1. And then 0 0.6 times 2 equals 1.2. Unit is 1. Then 0 0.2 times 2 equals 0 0.4. Unit is 0. 0 0.4 times 2 is equal to 0 0.8 and the unit is 0. Okay, and then we're going to multiply 0 0.8 times 2 and we're going to get 1.6 and our unit is 1. So I can stop right here. The reason is because um, this step right here, 0 0.8 times 2 equals 1.6. We've already seen this happening right here. So which means after this 1, we are going to see another 1. And we're going to see 0, 0, 1, 1, and then etc. So this step right here, it is repeated. So, let's go to step 3. Step 3 is combining of all of the previous steps. So, step 1 and step 2. So, what I mean by that is, um, we're going to grab the results from step 1, and then write, and then we're going to write that first. 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. And then we're going to write the decimal. So, we're going to write a point, and then grab the results from step 2. So, which is 0, 1, and then 1, 1, 0, 0. And then, as I said before, this part, 1, 1, 0, 0 is repeated. So, next we'll go to step 4. So, step 4 is changing the previous result into a scientific notation. So, if I change this into scientific notation, it will be 1.01101 1 0 1 1 0 1 0 1 and 1 1 0 0 and this step is repeated okay but now we need to remind ourselves this is no longer base 10 this is a base 2 so i need to write times 2 to the power of 5 not 10 to the power of 5. Okay? So then we'll go, so we're going to go to step 5, which is to find the sine bit, the exponent, and the mantissa. Okay? So to find the sine bit, okay, we need to look at our original problem, which is positive 45. So if our original problem is positive, then the sine bit is going to be 0. If the original problem is negative, the sine bit is going to be negative. I mean, the sine bit is going to be 1. So, as I said, the sine bit should be 0 because it is positive, 45. Okay, next is to find the exponent. Okay, now, exponent, we can grab that from the previous step. So our exponent is 5. So exponent is 5. 
to find the mantissa, we can get it from the previous answer, the previous step. So the mantissa is going to be the decimal of the previous step. So therefore, it is 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and then 1, 1, 0, 0, and that portion is repeated. Next is to find the biased exponent, okay? So in order to find a biased exponent, I'm just going to call BE for now, okay? It is equal to the exponent that we just found in, in, from step 5, which is this right here. And then we're going to add that by 127. It's always 127. So it will be 130. Now, the next step is to convert the bias exponent into binary. So if I convert 132 into binary, it will be, let's see, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 0. So this is the 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. So 4 plus 128 is 132. Okay. So we're at the final step. So in order to do the final step, we need to combine um, all of the previous answers. Okay. So we're going to start off with the sine bit. So the sine bit, we said that is 0. We can find out from step 5, right? So this will be 0 right here. The next 8 will be the exponent, okay? And we can grab that from step 7, which, which we can find it from here. So it is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, zero. Okay. The next 23 are the mantissa. Okay. So to find a mantissa, we need to go to step five. And mantissa can be found right here. So let me just separate this. Okay. So that's the sine bit. And after this black line, it's going to be the mantissa. So it's going to be zero, one, one zero one zero one 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 zero zero but one one zero zero is repeated right so we need to um fill um the entire 32 bits so let's keep on writing this so one one zero zero one one zero zero one one zero zero okay i think that's it but let's just double check so if I count all of these bits, it should be 32. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2. So that's 32. Okay. So this is how you find the 32-bit binary of a decimal. This time, I want to teach you some of the major problems with floats. And I want to tell you how, how unperfect it is. So on the screen, you can see a very short C code. And the very first line after the main, um, I made a float variable called x, and it contains the result of 0 0.6 plus 0 0.7. And the next line is very simple. All it does is just prints out the float x with up to 20 decimal places. So we should expect that the answer should be 1.3 with 19 zeros. However, it gives us something completely different. Instead, it gives us 1.29 and with other, um, with some other numbers. And as you can see, it has some round off error. I want to tell you guys a very short history 
and where the float didn't really work. So back in 1991, the American military, they released anti-missile system called the Patriot into the Saudi Arabia. And its purpose was to take down the Scud missiles and to protect the military base from those missiles. However, something odd happened. It didn't take down a single Scud missile. And due to this, 28 American troops were killed and the Americans had to take the blame for it. So a lot of engineers, they looked into the, uh, they looked into Patriot and they're trying to find the reason why it wasn't working. After some research, they found out that they were using 32-bit float. And as we've seen earlier, um, it, it always has these round-off errors. And they were using float to represent seconds, time. Well, in Patriot, they use the speed, the distance, and time to calculate the incoming missiles and to predict the trajectory. So after they turned on the machine, after 100 hours, they found out that the Patriot was already off by 0 0.000001 seconds. So, so due to them using 32-bit float, 28 troops were killed, and it brought a national embarrassment to them. So here's a lesson for you guys. Never use float when the round off error is not allowed, which means never use float to represent time, and it will always come back to you with bigger problems.